Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you had a good virtual sandwich and uh, are ready for this afternoon's session. Uh, we're, uh, we've got a session on dosimetry and quantitative spect. And to kick that off, I'm happy to introduce um, Jill Tipping from uh, the Christie NHS Foundation Trust, who will tell us about uh, their work in dosimetry at the Christie. So welcome, Jill. Hello there. Hi. Can people see that? Yes, I can see that perfectly. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, obviously, my name's Jill. I'm one of the team of physics in nuclear medicine at the Christie. Um, and um, I've had a, a long lasting interest in dosimetry. So let me just start for a few minutes as a, as a poster show for the need for dosimetry. So enlightened medics, such as in this paper, have long recognized the need for dosimetry to allow personalization of our MRT therapies to optimize benefit and control toxicity. Um, and I don't need to remind you that dosimetry is actually written into this legislation, both of the European URAS and basic safety standards and is translated into IRMA. So let's just have a little look at the actual wording where it's saying that exposures to target volume should be individually planned and verified. Um, and now this wording is actually now part of the new RSAC applications that have to say how they will, uh, how the medics will um, attempt to do this when they're applying for a therapy RSAC. So it's beginning to be taken as not just an add-on and a nice to know, but as something that is built into the whole procedure. Um, just briefly, there was um, a review throughout Europe a couple of years ago looking at the use of dosimetry. Um, I'm, I'm afraid that can't do it still outweigh the can do it, apart from within the CERT therapies. But this paper and the report that goes with it are a very interesting read as a snapshot of where we are across in Europe. And in the UK, um, an IPEM group tackled how we are doing in the terms of dosimetry. And uh, below is a rather intriguing fan diagram of the excuses people were giving for not wanting to do dosimetry. But the report does conclude that as medicine moves towards a more personalized approach with interest in dosimetry, um, and evidence for the clinical benefit of MRT dosimetry mounting, centers are becoming better equipped to provide a routine dosimetry service. And this report has been set up to provide advice on the resources needed to set up a dosimetry service and demonstrates that none of the challenges addressed in this report should prevent personalized MRT. And it has a final little add-on that in the need for dosimetry, particularly within multi-center standardization and clinical trials. Okay, people are saying that they have had a lack of dosimetry guidelines. Here's a snapshot of what's available, but I have it on very good authority from a member of the EANM dosimetry committee that this year we can look out um, for new guidelines coming out for PRRT, for thyroid cancer, there's a new guideline come out for MIBG and there will be other ones coming out this year. So we're trying to tackle the lack of guidelines. And of course, we have backup in publications from MERD, particularly with helpful to um, quantitative imaging. Just a final plea again, uh, this paper came out of the Solimetry trial, which for those of you who haven't heard of it, um, was um, a multi-center trial testing um, the ability to use I123 dosimetry to predict I131 dosimetry um, under the influence of this trial called uh, this drug called Selimetinib. But 
as a group, all the centres worked together to achieve protocols and standardisation, both in their imaging and their dosimetry. And what happened was that by doing this work to, to standardise things and looking at the uncertainties involved in this, we were able to come much closer and um, we had much more precision. I won't say accuracy, but we were able to work together as a group. And we knew that things measured at one centre would be the same as for the, um, another centre. Anyway, that is just a little plea for the use of dosimetry. Um, and just to say for the last six years, there's been a project called MRT dosimetry where um, a group of hospitals working with European metrology centres, such as the NPL, uh, we were looking at the ac accuracy and reproducibility of dosimetry. And to that end, we undertook um, an exercise of dosimetry cross comparison. So we needed to have a model and a dose to start with. Um, and after a lot of head scratching, we decided that our model was going to be based on the ICRP 110 Phantom, which is now um, all very often used as a standard in radiation protection. Um, and in order to make this, ex this um, cross comparison work, we decided we would make our own ICRP 110. And, and we did this by 3D printing where we printed some of the major organs. We had a spleen, a liver, the two kidneys, which were compartmentalized, and we added a tumor. And then we took a mathematical model, courtesy of, of Lund Hospital, of the pharmacokinetics of a PRRT therapy. And what we actually did was then to create and fill this phantom six times and scan it to represent the sequence of a full therapy. Um, this was obviously quite an undertaking to get it right. And we, we were, we've actually been, um, did far better than we thought we could physically. All these scans were then packaged off and sent to 10 different institutions or commercial dosimetry suppliers. And we also undertook it uh, as, a, as a Christie. And you can see here, here is our working through of this on our Hermes system. And I know Helena is probably sitting on her hands at the moment because we had a very intriguing mix of results when we started looking at how all the different centres did. And there are some consistencies and some very big differences. So let's just start by looking at large organs, such as the liver and the spleen. They're just on about or just below 100% accurate and all quite close with just about a 10% spread with a few outliers for the spleen. The kidneys as a whole are okay, just a little bit low from 100% dose recovery, but we upset the apple cart when we separated the kidneys into the cortex and medulla. And as you can see, the medulla doses are significantly overestimated. And that's because they're subject to inscatter from the cortex, which obviously results in an overestimating of activity. Um, so it, it should really indicate, highlights how you have to consider when you're doing dosimetry, partial volume effects may have to consider in scatter as well as out scatter. Um, however, the interesting bit is looking at the tumours on the far right. The average from the tumours is close to 100% accurate. It's in the 90%. But look at the huge range of results with some systems wildly estimating. And we probably think this is a result of partial correction, partial volume corrections, or maybe even not having partial volume corrections at all. So 
this is the first time we've undertaken a comparison like this. There's an, the reason why we've been waiting publication is that we've had a lot of uh, things to make sure we've got right before we, we, we publish. No names are given, no, um, no fingers are raised. It's just highlighting the range of activities you can get with this um, range of doses you can get with exactly the same data. The major problem was getting that data into different dosimetry systems, um, which have been set up to read DICOM fields in different ways. And we discovered this was a major problem, which we've had to take time to sort through. Let's just pause for a second and reflect on this last year of lockdown. This has had a real effect on our therapy patients with cancelled, delayed treatments for a while, although we resumed and we're running at full steam again. But even at full steam, we are still working with restricted hospital stays um, for many patients and outpatient therapists, particularly in PRRT, for some. This has meant no very little chance to do repeated images for dosimetry and therefore we've had over the last year much less chance for dosimetry in only essential cases. So if I was to show you what we've done over the, just the last year there wouldn't be a great deal but let's just look at where we apply dosimetry. Only in trials when we're dealing with CA thyroid and thyrotoxics, not in radiums. We're using mainly organ based dosimetry for our lotetium dotatates, voxel based dosimetry for CERTs, organ based for MIBGs, and in PSMA, well, that's in the future, and I'll come back to that because we're looking at it. So, PRRT is one of our bread and butter dosimetry uh, that we work. And here's our standard sequence. This is a five scans, all co-registered, ready to go through the dosimetry sequence. But what we have been focusing on, um, as well as doing standard dosimetry, um, I, we've had a PhD project under the um, an equal persona of Emma Page, uh, based on a cohort just of 15 patients who would have full, full dosimetry quite early on. And we wanted to address image-based bone marrow dosimetry because for many years, the standard technique to assess bone marrow dose has been to take repeated blood measurements. And there are papers uh, published through the EANM showing how to calculate a bone marrow dose from blood measurements, making a lot of assumptions. Um, equally, there have been other papers published, particularly in um, the field of antibody therapies, showing that bone marrow doses related better to toxicities. And a couple of other groups have been looking at how bone marrow doses are related to toxicities in uh, PRRT. So the first thing you can see from this cohort of 15 patients is you get a very different excretion curve or time activity curve from the blood measurements on the left, which are very fast um, and start from a very high level and obviously reduce to the retained activity, the fractional activity based on imaging bone marrow in the form of the lump of vertebrae L2 to L4, which is the most common way of doing it as seen above. And you can see it's not an easy technique because you're measuring a very low signal in a very low background. So it is very noisy. And we have to be aware of that we're, we're suboptimally imaging and be very careful with what we're doing. But you can see, on the, in terms of the time scale, there is more retention and a far slower TAC based on imaging than in the blood. So there's something, a different story going on, and we wanted to see what the differences actually meant. 
So when you're trying to attempt to do symmetry like this, we're very grateful to have a system set up in Hermes where you can actually put in recovery coefficients, partial volume factors, including for red marrow, which is going to be very important for us to assure we're getting the best quantification we can. Um, and the other thing that we can um, make use of is the fact that if you're going to measure L2 to L4, you can scale this uh, by assuming that L2 to L4 is 6.7% of the total red marrow. And again, these facilities are provided in the Hermes system. So in order to do this, we started off by working out how best to do a recovery coefficient for L2 to L4. We tried cylinders, we tried spheres, and in the end, we resorted to using our 3D printer again, this time to create the vertebrae L2 to L4. And in fact, Emma being Emma, we did three. We did a small, medium, and a large. So we had all different patient sizes that we could use. It was imaged with um, a matching background so that the signal to background matched what was seen in therapy. <coughs> and we're going to image that and we're going to get a recovery factor. Uh, then going back to the, the actual calculation then of the bone marrow, we're going to obviously reconstruct and segment, use our recovery coefficient um, and develop our TAC. But then comes the next bit that we need to scale that cumulative activity to the total red marrow. And then using that, we can now use um, a diagnostic CT and create a patient-specific red marrow volume corrected for trabecular bone volume and cellularity and use that within the Alinda calculation. So we've, got, we've gone around the houses a bit, but we've got an image based volume corrected or mass corrected bone marrow dose based on L2 to L4. So the whole idea of this work was um, that we wanted to see if bone marrow dose did relate to toxicity, because this has been panned in many papers. And um, different groups have tried to relate bone marrow toxicity to the dose. And what we also did was obviously we started to look at um, platelets, the nadir of the platelet drop related to the dose that we'd thought. And we compared blood-based and image-based. And boy, were we disappointed. Um, we couldn't really get any different or improved correlation at all. There did not seem to be any advantage in predicting toxicity through bone marrow dose. So we delved deeper. We decided to look if there was more information in looking at groups that had been pre-treated by therapies that could affect bone marrow reserve and behaviours such as chemo or radiotherapy. And then we separated this group of patients into therapy naive and pre-treated. With blood-based measurements, we began to see a slight separation between the groups with a higher correlation for the naive group. So, but then when we did the same for the image-based dose, we saw a dramatic split between the groups. The pre-treated group showed a weird non-physical correlation, meaning that we couldn't relate things because the bone marrow was behaving differently. But the naive group showed a really good correlation with a high significance uh, with the platelet toxicity of above 0.87. So we think we are beginning to understand a little more that the, what the information bone marrow image-based bone marrow dosimetry can tell us um, and the importance of understanding what we're measuring in an image. 
So armed with that uh, information, we uh, applied it in real life. And, and this is when we came to treat a patient. He was very frail with uh, a poor kidney function of below 50, uh, a kidney GFR of below 50. And our oncologists decided to treat with three gigabecquerels of lutetium dotidate and do full dosimetry to see the effects. So we ended up doing a full dosimetry and assessed the bone marrow dose both ways as well as the standard organs. So the first thing to note on the left here is that the kidney doses appear to be quite normal for PRRT therapy, albeit this is at three gigabex, not at 7.4, but the kidney doses aren't go weren't going to cause the problems that we thought they would. Um, the spleen dose were within limits as well, so we didn't. We we wanted to check what the problem was, because if you look at the sequence of pay, uh, scans throughout the time period, there is relatively little clearance beyond the first day, um, and in fact, we worked out that there was the kidney function was poor enough that there was hardly any input into the kidneys. They weren't up, taking anything up, so there was free dotatate still circulating around. And this made a difference in terms of what the bone marrow was telling us. So on the bottom right, we have information based on the bone marrow dosimetry, both the blood and the image base. Now, the first thing to notice is that the blood bases, blood doses, are far lower than the image-based doses. And this factor has been reported by other groups um, as well. And there have been suggestions as to why the image-based doses are giving higher results. And that is, again, thinking about what might be in the bone marrow itself and could hang on to the PRRT. And there's talk of trans, um, I can't even say it, translation of lutetium to transferrin and progenitor cells with somatostatin receptors in bone marrow. But what it clearly indicates is whichever method you choose, it makes a difference to the size of the dose. Um, we actually treated this gentleman twice. And you can see he got a very similar dose the second time round. Um, but we've subsequently not given him further treatment because at the moment the current thinking is that you do not go above two gray dose to the bone marrow. We've gone to three gray if we choose to use the image based. If we were choosing to use the blood based, we'd have carried on with the sequence quite happily. So which is the right answer? We think that there is more information in the image-based method. But then that raises the thorny question of, well, what is the safe limit to give to a patient? This patient did have severe patient uh, platelet drops. He's, you know, he did have hemotoxicity, but he recovered. And other groups are also suggesting that the two gray limit may be very, very cautious because it's been based on external beam radiotherapy with quite different radiobiology. Just a couple of minutes there um, left, really, Jill. Sorry to... OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rattle through there, no problem. OK, quick messages then for what our work on Dota Tate. Definitely moving to image-based bone marrow. Um, we're now interested in cross radiation from tumours close to the spine, which may lead to us to be using the voxel model. Well, with using standard quantification, we've yet to explore SUV spec, but what is very clear is partial volume effects and specific recovery coefficients. Right, I'm rattling. Cert, new recommendations have come out for resin microspheres. Um, just simply to say, they are recommending that you do not use the BSA method anymore, that you use the partition model or 3D dosimetry um, and, 
and do the partition model based on your MAA spec. And that's just showing the difference between the various, the simplistic model, uh, a partition based model in blue in the middle, and then a full boxel but based dose symmetry, giving us a different range of doses on the right hand side. And we are moving towards full voxel based dose symmetry, which can also be blended in with partition model. So um, we, we get a better reflection of the dose distribution. New ideas insert. There's recently been announced a new dosimetry study with Therosphere, where they are now, instead of planning or targeting to 205 grays to the tumors, they're planning to 250 grays. And this is in HCC, if there is a big, large, juicy single tumor. And then there's a dose of 120 gray or less to the perfused liver tissue, still keeping the 30 gray or less to the lungs. And also, if they're treating just one side of the liver, they're going to have a dose of less than 150 gray to the whole liver. So it's all based on dose symmetry. It's essential. We're beginning to look at holmium spheres. And here we've got a real quantitative imaging problem because holmium has some very sneaky, very small, but very high energy emissions over an MEV. And what this means is they contribute to a high scatter region above the main holmium peak. And so the way that this is suggested you deal with it is you take this little peach color, that is your scatter window that you're going to subtract so that you're left with your holmium peak and then the suggestion is that you use Monte Carlo scatter correction on that peak to finally re re get rid of all other scatter. And of course, this is um, one benefit that, that Hermes have offered. And when I checked with Steve and Helena, they'd already got this, Helena, they'd already got this set up ready for Holmium. PSMA, we're working on dosimetry, building a model. Because we like our phantoms, we'll probably be building a phantom for the evaluation of the best techniques for bone mets, but we expect it to be voxel based um, as other groups are beginning to, to look at it as well. Whoops. And then just one final mention. This other paper, it's an ENM guidelines on uncertainty analysis. I've sneaked that word in a couple of times, but what became very important and clear to us while we were doing the uh, dose cross comparison was an understanding of the uncertainties at each stage of the dosimetry process. And some very clever mathematicians and the, um, hospital physicists have worked out the, uh, a paper to describe and taking us through this rather uh, complex chain of events and how to calculate them. And we have written our own MATLAB program based, uh, based to calculate uncertainties for dosimetry chains. And just to show you the sort of results they can turn up, this is just two sites with two data sets. And although we seem to be fairly consistent and good at volumes and recovery factors and activities, what became very clear was it was the fitting of the TAC, um, how um, the original activity was calculated, how the cumulative activity was calculated and how the, T, um, the TAC was fitted um, led to some huge and significant differences in uncertainties according to the techniques used by the systems. And that, that although these, the S factors and all of these other factors are quite well defined, that propagates through to uncertainty in dose. And so it is really, for the future, I think it's, it's going to be really helpful to understand uncertainties as we go through with our dosimetry. And that helps us then when we're comparing like with like. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jill. That was a really interesting talk. And I've got so many questions that I want to ask, but I'm aware that we are uh, running a little bit um, behind time. But I'll, I'll very quickly just uh, fire a few, a 
few things out right. if you don't mind. Sorry, I realised I've got my camera on from that. Let's <laughs> help. Nice to see you, Jill. <laughs> um, so your bone marrow dissimilarity work is really interesting, and it is a bit shocking that it's that different between the blood sampling and the image-based methods. Oh, so yes. It's really valuable work you're doing there. Um, yeah. I wondered, so the, the, the image-based method uh, assumes that the, that, rep, that L2 to L4 or L2 to L5, however you want to draw it, represents 6.7% of the total uh, bone marrow. And, and further included in that is the, the idea that it's a homogeneous um, concentration of activity in all the bone marrow. Uh, I wondered, you know, yeah, yes. So if you're uh, looking at the images, how, how wrong do you think that is? Like how much of an issue is that? That's a very good question, and I need another PhD student to answer that because some some groups of people use uptake in, the, and I, um, there's an option to use the pelvis as well. So I think that is a very pertinent question, but it's it's clearly identified there is a big difference between image based dosimetry and the blood dosimetry. Um, mm. Really interesting um, work. The proof of the pudding is in the correlation, really. Absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. I wondered, so look, thinking about your MRT dosimetry uh, project, the cross comparison that you did, again, really, really valuable work, but slightly terrifying variability in the dose uh, results, especially for the tumor. I wondered if that was to do with the, the voice sizes, because I know when I had a crack at doing this uh, with the Hermes software, um, I think I did two goes through, one using a nuclear medicine threshold boy for the tumour and one using a CT boy for the tumour. Does that contribute yeah. a lot to the difference? It it does, although looking at it, yes, the uncertainties on the boys aren't that different. Okay. But it indicated, it's, it's in the activity, it's the partial volume. If you've got the partial volume correction, it's so sensitive, particularly with small sizes as to what you're looking um, some German groups have been experimenting with using an expanded VOI, but that's not always possible because you've got other activity and then you've got, mm. yeah, it's, it's, but it has highlighted an area that needs intensive research again. Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Th simple thresholding isn't the answer, unfortunately. Um, you cannot often draw on the diagnostic CT because a small tumour may be, may be very hard to, to mm. see on the CT. So this is an area that is uh, an, another one that we want to move forward, mm. particularly with, with PSMA, where you're going to be delineating regions also in bone as well. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have uh, one more kind of general question, which might be good to put to our, our next um, speakers as well, uh, which is that I know there's been a lot of interest lately in single time point dosimetry. You know, one of the major issues with doing dosimetry is, especially if your patients are from far away, getting them travel back multiple times over the course of a week to attend for, for imaging. And it would be really great if we could do the dosimetry just based on the you know, post-therapy imaging, which is currently standard of care. Um, I seen a couple of papers using it on kidneys and i can mm. almost almost half accept it on kidneys because that is only for safety mm -hmm. you're proving you're proving safety i but and yet some other trials have been escalating the number of times prrt is given based on a cumulative kidney dose and i certainly wouldn't want to use a single time point result on something like that, where you're pushing right up to the threshold of, a, of kidney toxicity. Okay, so, so you don't think that even with a properly timed image, and um, you wouldn't you wouldn't trust that still. You wouldn't trust that. Um, I'd, I'd accept it for a safety, say okay. you, to say you're well within safety limits. But if mm. you were then going to go ahead and use a kidney dose to optimize, to say go up to a 35 gray threshold or a 40 uh -huh. gray threshold. I wouldn't be as comfortable using a single time point dose at that point. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, a question currently in Hermes whether we should implement that in our voxel dosimetry software, the possibility to input an effective dose. If you know from literature or if you're expecting you know, three days of effective uh, half-life, so I mean effective half-life um, there, 
and you, but you only have one time point, would you be able to yeah. use that in your software? Yeah, kidneys, I feel is good. Uh, you know, the, the, the most, what's the word? The one organ I, I feel it, it might be acceptable. There's, there's a good signal and when you um, do the dosimetry, you can get a reasonable half-life. Um, spleen perhaps but the, the kidneys it's focused on because they're the greatest organ at risk for radiation protection mm -hmm. okay interesting thanks very much jill i can see that steve is uh champing at the bit to get going no it's okay <laughs> I, was, I had my eye on the clock it was a great discussion i didn't want to interrupt it really um but um i'm sure it's pertinent for the rest of the afternoon as well so i'm sure we'll okay. revisit some of these points so thanks again jill it's great great Take presentation care. thank you um uh, on the next on the agenda, we've got a, a series of short talks uh, from the team at uh, the Oxford University Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust. Um, and the first talk will be by uh, Daniel McGowan on Oxford's clinical and research use of Hermes. Um, it'll then be followed by a talk by uh, his colleague Will Turner on lutetium-177 DOTA lesion quantitation and display with affinity. And finally, by Lara Bonney on SNMMI Lutetium 177 challenge processing in Hermes. So, um, so I think for the questions for these, uh, I think it might be better to have them grouped at the end, actually. So we'll just go from one talk to the other, if that's all right, as they're short. Hi, Dan. Hi. Sorry. Okay, we can't hear you if you're speaking. I don't know if you're muted. Is that any better? That's better. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'll, I'll just hide my camera. I can't see the camera on this. Yeah. So can you see that all right? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so it disappeared for some reason. Um, okay, thanks for the introduction, Steve. I'm going to give um, a brief overview of Oxford's use of Hermes, then, as Steve says, we'll have a follow up with two more talks about some specific projects we're doing at the moment. So this is more kind of historical some of the projects that we have done um, up to now with Hermes, both using the software that they've got um, and projects with other companies. So at Oxford, um, we've got two different Hermes servers. We have one for all our clinical use and one for um, research use, principally um, for imaging trials. And both of these servers are the sort of Gold Elect servers. So it means we can connect remotely from anywhere in the hospital or now under COVID at home via the, the VPN system. So it's really useful to be able to access that data wherever you, you are. So the research server we've got, and um, there was a need probably about a decade ago that we identified to um, keep track of all our kind of imaging trial data, especially the trials that were either sponsored by the hospital trust or the university. Um, and we wanted to make sure we could store both the DICOM, the image data, as well as non-DICOM data, such as like image reports, PDFs, Excels, um, but also list data. So for um, pet studies in particular, we wanted to have a list um, data in order to um, look at new different technologies that are coming on um, of how we could process that. So we got a research homey server that would allow us to have a dedicated server just for all these um, research studies. And one of the key things that we wanted from the university side of it was to have a way of pushing our data from the hospital through the firewalls to the university. And the way we got the information governance to agree to this is um, to have a system whereby on Hermes you can anonymize the data. So we had kind of one set of um, folders for original data, one set of folders for anonymized data, and then you could log in with a special kind of push account, and then you'd only see the anonymous data, and then from that you could push that data over to the university. And it was fully audited, so you could see who pushed what data, and the people that could push the data uh, were kind of trained up in knowing exactly what they could and couldn't um, do. And that's working really well. It allows us to kind of um, do kind of novel research on the images based in the university, um, but keep all the images together per trial basis on the trust side, which is what we wanted. Um, so as well as kind of the use for storage and anonymization, we also do use the Hermes kind of application to some of the um, image analysis, particularly for kind of the, the trials where I'm involved, so I'm the co-investigator, um, such as these. So one of the ones these is involved quite a bit is a tracer called FMISO. So FMISO is um, a hypoxic imaging pet agent, um, so it's only really used in research trials, um, but because it um, acts purely by passive diffusion, you have to image for quite long times post-injection. So here we can see, I don't know, can you see my mouse? I'm not sure if it works. 
Yes, it's what is fine. Yep. Yeah. Oh, yes. okay. that, yeah. um, so with here we do um, uh, quite a long protocol. So we have a 45 minute dynamic scan initially. So you can see where we inject the tracer through the patient. Then we do two hours post injection and four hours post injection. So you can see we look at the um, this is the protocol that Hermes made for us so that we could look at the three different time points in one kind of view. So you can see here's the tumor and here's the metastases. So over time, you can see the hypoxic um, tumors taking up the ethmizer. So it's getting um, increasingly active and could be hot. Um, and the blood that was kind of hot initially is being um, traced and washed out of that. So it's accumulating the tumor. And here you can see the small metastases. Also with Hermes, you can kind of um, gate to view different um, time points of the dynamic series if you want. And again, Hermes, I think, was one of the first that allowed us this dynamic pet capability. So it allows us to extract out the kind of the time activity curves um, for PET CT, which we can then create parametric maps. I won't go into today, but it's a useful feature we've used a lot for uh, many of our different research trials. So I'll uh, mention briefly kind of um, one analysis that we do on these hypoxic images um, using FMISO. So typically in the literature, you analyze is often using what's called a tumor to blood ratio image. So you effectively divide the whole image by um, your blood value. And then it's considered that if the TBR is greater than 1.4, uh, then that's hypoxic. If it's less than 1.4, it's not hypoxic. So on the Hermes kind of, um, this is the, kind of the old style hybrid viewer, you can use the math tool to kind of divide your image to get these nice kind of um, TBR style images out. So you can see this poor patient had quite a large hypoxic tumor and then several nodal uh, metastases, but it's quite easy to see visually what's going on. And then what we want to do with lots of these trials is we're giving them different drugs or treatments that might alter their hypoxic status of the tumor. So hypoxia in patients um, gives them a poor prognosis. So we want different ways of improving that hypoxia. So for instance, with radiotherapy treatments, if you have a hypoxic tumor, it's, you generally need about three times uh, more radiation in order to get the same level of cell kill for normoxic tumor. So there's an interest to change the hypoxic status of tumors. So here we can kind of extract out the different pixel values within our sort of volume of interest of that tumor we're interested in. So we can extract that to calculate what has been that sort of tumor to blood um, volume of tissue that's greater than one before within that tumor. So we can look at for um, specific patients, this trial we did recently, published recently, um, where we gave them this anti-malarial drug, atovacrone, and this um, reduces oxygen consumption in the tumors. Therefore, it alters your hypoxic status. So these patients had the, the drug for one to two weeks. And using Hermes, we were able to measure that hypoxic volume in the patient's f um, before and after and compare the, the total volume and how that changed. And you can see you're getting quite large changes with the drug. And without the drug, you're actually getting increases over time. Another um, tool that we've been using Hermes for is for storing all our PET data. So to reconstruct PET, you require um, the CTAC and the Sinogram if you want to alter your kind of um, basic reconstruction. If you want to look at uh, more kind of timing changes, you need the list file as well. So we now store all our um, CTACs and Sinograms on our Hermes server routinely for all our patients, um, which allows us to have basically like a Hermes Sinogram library where you can search up patients to re-reconstruct that data as new reconstruction technology comes along. And also for our list data, so all the um, PET list data for all our research patients, we store that on Hermes as well. And that's part of the non bicom data that we're particularly keen to be able to store um, on our Hermes server and transfer. And part of what this has allowed us to do with kind of our Hermes Sinogram library is when we worked with G Healthcare to um, evaluate their new reconstruction QClear, we're able to kind of search back on our library system using the kind of the Hermes Gold browser. So search like lung nodules, metastinal nodes, different nets, a whole range of different um, indications where we could then go back, take our old PET images, re-reconstruction with the latest technology and compare the two different systems. Um, for lots of this kind of optimization work, um, we also want lots of different parameters that we're kind of testing out. So we've got Hermes to develop it's like an eight PET spec protocol so that um, our poor clinician could score lots of different um, exams, lots of different options to test out how our um, the new reconstructions were performing. So on to more kind of Hermes specific work we've done. This is some work we did um, a couple of years ago with the lung lobar quantification that now we use routinely for patients where they're having um, lung surgery to assess what is likely to be the impact if certain bits of the lung are, are removed. But this was um, research work we did where we looked at um, 
spec CT, VQ spec CT using the long lobe quantification program down here, compared to hyperbolized then on the CT and um, showing that the Hermes program worked really well. Um, and as I said, that's what we're now using uh, clinically. Um, we've also done quite a lot in terms of spec reconstruction. This is work um, from Charlotte Porter, an MC student a few years ago. So she looked at um, how we could improve our techniques in power thyroid imaging. So at this point, um, Hermes had just released um, some new hybrid reconstruction algorithms. So we um, looked through a whole variety of different reconstructions um, that are available. And then we mentioned earlier that hybrid um, recon fours out there, we're eagerly awaiting testing out some of the reconstructions that are available in that. But this was, um, at the time, the one that we found was, worked the best for us. So you can see here that the visual, visualization with this um, basal reconstruction is really quite nice. Um, and the one that we used as part of this work was um, eight iterations, 10 subsets, and this Bayesian LRP um, FMH algorithm with a weighting of 0.1. We're in the process of writing this up for a publication at the moment. It's been presented at um, BNMS before. The other work um, that Charlotte did was looking at um, Graham Starling imaging. So whereas now we do um, our post search imaging on PET CT, um, you can do them on spec CT. And for the first um, probably year or so of our service, we did do all our imaging on um, spec CT. So we've got um, quite a large number of cases where we've done the imaging on spec CT. So we want to be able to improve our kind of quantification from the spec CT as, as best as we can. So working with um, Hermes, they've developed this Monte Carlo um, collimator modeling. So we're testing that out um, as to how accurate it would be. So we use this um, 3 u printed liver phantom uh, which the Royal Marsden and Certex made up called Abdoman, uh, where you can kind of insert in lesions to um, simulate having um, lesions in the, the liver. And you'll see an image of it here. And then we can calculate what the um, conscious recovery was that we're seeing the quantification we're able to get from these different lesions. So in this case, it's 40 millimeter sphere diameter and a 30 millimeter. So you can see this is kind of a kind of traditional way of doing um, sort of the G default two iteration 10 subset. And you can then apply the Hermes Monte Carlo Collimator Modeling and we increase your quantum recovery quite nicely. And again, Charlotte's the same piece of work, optimize the person image, in this case to five iterations, 15 subsets. So you can see the jump up when you add in this um, Monte Carlo Collimator Modeling. So if you compare it to what we had originally, that's quite a huge increase really in quantum recovery. So getting much better quantification really that we can then use to apply the symmetry that Jill just mentioned to our CERT patients. And we're planning kind of going back retrospectively in, analyzing the, the data we've got um, and applying obviously the, the best possible reconstruction we can to that. So you can see here an impact visually. This is one of our, our patients. This is kind of the reconstruction we used to do. Um, if you then do the kind of 075 iteration 15 subsets, you can see you get much nicer detail of what's going on. And then if you apply this kind of final full Monte Carlo collimator modeling, you can see visually it looks very similar. Um, which is great for the clinical reporting, but crucially, we're getting an extra 14% contrast recovery. Um, so we're getting more quantitative data out of the um, reconstruction. So the inclusion of that um, paper was that we recommend to use this Monte Carlo collimator modeling for this uh, spec CT imaging. And here's the paper if anyone wants to take a look. And actually, we're in the process now of moving all our spec CTs in Oxford over to HIV spec, but we can report on that next time when we've completed the, the transition. So many thanks for listening. Obviously, thanks to Hermes for coping with all my different suggestions of software as we've tweaked things as we've gone along and for Charlotte for uh, her work. So Will and Lara is now going to discuss the two of our current projects that we're using uh, with Hermes. Unless there's any sort of questions now for me, otherwise we could take them all at the end. Great, thanks for, thank thanks you so much, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, Helena. <laughs> That's all right. We're both saying thank you to Dan. Yeah. Uh, really great to see the pushing our reconstruction algorithm to its limits. Great to see the Bayesian uh, reconstruction uh, getting some air time there as well. Um, okay, I think it's Will next, is that correct? I think so, yeah. That's right. Yes, okay, great. Uh, there we go, that seems to have come up. Uh, uh, great, hang on, I still have to make you the presenter. Just give me a second and you'll be able to share the screen. No worries. Okay, there we go. I think you should have the option now to share a screen. It's just, here we go. It's just done a quick privacy thing really quickly. Perfect okay, timing, so won't let me do it without accepting this, unfortunately. No worries, it's okay. <laughs> Not sure if that's 
going to come through now. It hasn't come through for some reason, which is perfect time for it to have done this. Can it's you nice. see the um, you sharing drop-down? You can always do it via it mine, hasn't... Will, if it doesn't work. Um, yeah, it hasn't hasn't come up to say on my screen. It says that I'm presenter, but it doesn't say... That's all right, I'll give like it to you. It I'll, I'll hand it again. Hang on a second. Okay, I will, sure. I'll take the presentation back uh, to me, and then I'll uh, give it back to you. Okay. So here it comes again. There we go, that's better. It's come up this time. So if I do that, okay. do main screen, I'm hopefully <laughs> now going to have a print. There yes. we go, that looks better, okay. as long as you can see that. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> no um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as mentioned by um, Dan and everyone else, I'm going to quickly go over sort of what our protocol is at Oxford University Hospitals. Uh, we're using affinity for post-therapy lutetium dotatate um, therapies. Um, this sort of comes on following on from the affinity talk this morning as well, quite nicely. Uh, and also we use the SUV Spectre, as Dan mentioned. Oh, now it's not let me change slide. There we go. So to go over a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to go over a quick background of our therapies and what we do exactly, uh, before talking about the general uptake workflow that we take when we're undertaking post-therapy imaging. Then we talk about how we do our region outlining, how we do the quantitation of the lesions that we then find through this process, before talking about how we send cases for reporting by the consultant and then give a, br a brief summary of what I've spoken about. So at Oxford University Hospitals, uh, specifically at the Churchill Hospital, we do approximately two lutetium dose tape treatments each week. These are done on a Wednesday afternoon um, by our administration sort of around two o'clock and then the patient is administered, uh, so admitted overnight on the oncology ward before doing spec CT imaging the next morning in our nuclear medicine department. Uh, in late 2020, we switched from using hybrid viewers to be able to undertake the volume um, volume drawing, and we switched across to Affinity, which has worked very well uh, and sort of done an iterative process of improvement over the last few months. And as Dan mentioned previously, we have access to a Hermes Gold server, um, which is remote, mean, meaning that we can access it from home or from anywhere in the department, which is quite useful for doing uptakes from home, for example. To go briefly over the uptake workflow, the post-therapy imaging is done down in nuclear medicine department by the radiographers, along with the SUV reconstruction done in hybrid viewer, uh, not hybrid viewer, hybrid recon, sorry. Uh, and then physics are called once this is complete, and then we start looking at the previous cycle summary for the patient, if the patient has been at the trust for a previous cycle before. This is to get an idea of where the lesions were in past imaging and to get an idea of the naming conventions, just to sort of have the same process each time so that when these images are being reported, we can have it sort of continually roll along and easy to compare between different cycles. The NM spec and the CT are then loaded into Affinity before doing automatic outlining, uh, amending these regions as and when needed and creating new if needs be, before recording the lesion statistics and then creating a snapshot for reporting. For the image visualization, uh, we load up Affinity and drag and drop our CT and SUV reconstructed spec into Affinity with the nuclear medicine overlaid on the CT with a right click drag. We usually use the, screen, uh, the summary seen below with the uh, coronal, sagittal and transactional slices, as this gives a nice overview as to what we're looking at before we dive into doing all the region outlining. So it gives a bit of an overview to compare to previous summaries if they're available. For the outlining, we start off with a global threshold mentioned earlier this morning. Um, and then we split this volume as the global threshold, of course, just creates one large region. An example of the global threshold that can be seen on the left hand image as it scrolls through the slices. And we use a threshold default threshold of an SUV of 2.0. Um, we then use the splitting tool by right clicking on the volume uh, to then split all vo into volumes with volume greater than one mil to be able to get all these separate regions. It's worth noting on the right hand image with these split volumes that, for example, the right kidney can be seen to be merging into the liver, which is one of the problems we occur every now and then. But I'll go on to speak now about the amending of regions, but this works quite well as a sort of jumping off point. So once we've done the global thresholding and splitting, we assess these regions and amend them as required. One of the, things, one of the steps we undertake here is if an organ has more than three regions in it, we tend to draw the out and outline the whole region rather than individually labeling sort of five, six, seven different regions within the liver, for example. This can be seen in the bottom image where we've obviously just drawn around the whole liver rather than individually outlining each of those regions. 
We then use the single click text segmentation tool to add, add any additional regions as and when needed. Uh, this might be, for example, in this image, uh, doing the right kidney to be able to separate it from the liver. Or what is more common is if you look at a previous, um, a previous cycle for the patient and notice that there's a region which did have an SUV greater than two, but has now dropped to say an SUV max of 1.5, you might want to outline that as well just for comparison when the so when the consultant's looking at it they can see okay the uptake in this region has decreased from the previous cycle and it's not just magically disappeared we then manually draw regions as and when required which i believe in this case because of as you saw in the previous slide the joining of the right kidney and the liver the liver's been manually drawn using the paintbrush tool and so has the right kidney uh, so from this process the normal regions that we get are a left and right kidney a spleen uh, lesion uptake throughout the body and then if the number of lesions in one organ is greater than three we end up with a whole liver or whole lung for example all these regions are then saved into hermes gold as seg dot seg files so they can be loaded in future so if you want to go back again and have a look at this cycle with the patient's next cycle you can load all those seg those seg files into affinity with the ct inspect to have a look at how the regions were drawn previously Ooh, why is that there we go moving on to did i miss slide there no, I didn't, that's fine. Um, moving on to the lesion quantitation. Uh, so we record the Becquerels per mil and SUV data for each region. And this is input onto a in-house spreadsheet for recording the results along with the volume of each region. Um, in Affinity, as you saw this morning, you can switch between Becquerels per mil and SUV separately, but you can't display both at the same time. Um, but seeing the bottom left-hand side data tab, you can see that it's quite nicely displayed as to all the data you require to be, then e be able to easily put it into the spreadsheet switch over from SUV to Becquerel's per mil, for example, and then repeat the process again. The in-house spreadsheet then calculates the activity and the percentage uptake based off the administered activity for each region, which we're then able to put back into the imaging using the annotation tool, which I'll go over now. So by this point, we've used all of our transactional um, coronal and sagittal slice view, and we tend to move on to adjust the transactional slices um, sort of larger screen just to make it easier for seeing what we're doing. So in this time, once we've done this, we scroll through the slices to find the, at the uh, maximum area of each region and we annot use the annotation tool to be able to note the activity, the percentage uptake equivalents, the mean SUV and the maximum SUV as displayed on the spreadsheet, which we can then scroll through the entire um, patient image and then annotate all of these regions so that when we send the print, it's nice and obvious as to what region we're talking about. We can then use the uh, the Affinity Axial Multi Slice. Uh, sorry, we can then use the Multi Slice Screen Capture tool in Affinity, which is just in the bottom left hand side of the screen, a little circular button you can click, and it instantly produces this um, video scene on the left. Usually, you can scroll through this backwards and forwards, but for the case of this presentation, I've converted it into a video just to give an idea of what the outcome of this is. Um, each of the annotations appears on a single slice, so it doesn't become too confusing when scrolling backwards and forwards with multiple annotations on the screen at once, which shows quite nicely, and then. This screenshot is then saved to Hermes Gold, checked using hybrid view as it can be loaded back up through that, and then it's sent to PAX for the consultant to have a look at. A PDF of the therapy summary sheet seen previously, the Excel spreadsheet, is also sent to EPR so that if you want to go back and look at previous cycle statistics, we can do that as well. So to give you a quick summary, images are loaded in as CT of overlaid nuclear medicine spec CT, as I said, nuclear medicine spec, with the SUV reconstructed. A global threshold with SUV greater than two is then undertaken, and then the regions are split into smaller regions of greater than one mil volume. We then draw and amend these regions as needed to match previous cycles and to make sure that the regions are correctly, um, correctly drawn before recording the statistics of each of the regions and annotating it, the actual slices to be able to show this information. We then save a print of this and send it to PAX and PDF and send off the statistics summary to EPR. Uh, thank you very much for listening and unless there are any um, important questions i think we'll probably move straight over to lara's talk great thank you very much will that was uh, really interesting a nice detailed kind of blow by blow of how you have to um, work to quantify these um these studies um i wonder how approximately how long does it take um for you to do this because you do this for for every patient who goes through lutetium therapy yeah um it doesn't take especially in comparison to hybrid viewer it takes a lot less time in affinity um Good. i think that's what to over to affinity in the first place was sort of mm. suddenly doing that and it was much faster but 
you, depending on the complexity of the patient, it usually takes me about half an hour to 40 minutes to get through okay. a single patient. And given we only mm -hmm. have two patients on a given day, it's a manageable workload sort of for a Wednesday, okay. sort of, sorry, uh, Thursday morning. Okay, interesting. Thank you. And hopefully, uh, so I don't know if you saw Johan's uh, demo this morning of the new features coming, but the blob splitter, I think, will be perfect for the liver kidney merging situation that you described. So I'd be excited yes. to get you that version. <laughs> It'll be fantastic to get that sort of simplified a bit more. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Um, okay, uh, let's hand over to Lara. Okay, Lara, I'm going to make you the presenter. Okay, here it comes. So hopefully you should have an option now for sharing your screen. Hi, yeah. Hi, Lara. I can see your video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah. If we can maximise that, then we will be uh, good to go. Okay, fine. Yeah. Can you see me up then? Yes, we can. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Helena. Um, so following on from Will's talk on lutetium uptakes, I'm going to briefly talk about the SNMMI lutetium dissymmetry challenge um, and how we completed it using Hermes voxel dissymmetry. Um, so the SNMMI dissymmetry challenge is quite similar actually to the um, dissymmetry challenge Jill described earlier using the phantom, except this time um, SNMMI have given access to um, patient data and there's two patients they've given access to. Um, I'm going to talk about um, part one of the challenge, which is using the SPECT um, images at four time points to perform dissymmetry. Um, but there are um, multiple parts of the challenge as well. So once you've performed your dissymmetry, they've asked you to return the dissymmetry data um, and they are then going to analyse it for the sources and magnitude of variability. Um, their eventual aim is harmonisation and standardisation of um, dissymmetry, as are all of the aims. Um, but it seems like a um, a nice project and it's um, been well taken up in centres across the world so hopefully they will collect lots of data. Um, let's skip slide. Um, so as you've heard from Will in Oxford we do single time point post therapy spec CT um, the day after therapy administration and we do activity uptake measurements. As yet we do not do any dissymmetry for our lutetium patients but it is something we would like to do in the future, it's something we're moving towards. And so this was a really nice way to kind of dip our toes into the water, have a go at um, lutetium dissymmetry without having to kind of actually do multiple time point imaging for any patients as yet. So we started with voxel dissymmetry. Um, I imagine Helen is going to run through this in more detail earlier. So this will be a bit of a whistle stop tour of the steps we did and the results we got. Um, so I'm just going to show you patient um, four, who is John Doe. There was a um, second patient as well. So um, I've loaded all four time point images into um, voxel dissymmetry and then selected um, study one as our reference time point. And we click continue and we can then register all of the subsequent time points to study one. Um, I've chosen the CT for registration, um, but there are multiple. Um, you can also choose the spectral pet image. We use the full registration mode and then applied that to each of the subsequent images. You can visually inspect this to check that you're happy with it and manually move it around if you'd also prefer. And then we can do the dose calculation. So for lutetium, obviously it's an, um, used for the imaging as well as for the therapy. Um, and then the time to first scan was about four hours and we used the default simulation protocol. So we click calculate and we get our voxel by voxel dose image which I've then loaded into hybrid view effusion and um, fused with the um, reference CT, um, which you can see here. I've windowed this very, very heavily so that you can see that there is some dose in the spleen and the kidneys. Um, and you can see that there are multiple lesions throughout the liver in this patient. So then we go on to hybrid view of volume drawing. Currently, you cannot um, load your dose maps into Affinity, so that's quite a... <laughs> It's a bit of a downside, um, but I, as Johan said this morning, in version three of Affinity, you will be able to load your dose maps into Affinity. Um, as Will just mentioned, it's quite a lot more time consuming to draw these kind of regions in Hybrid Viewer. Um, so hopefully, once you can load it into Affinity, it'll be a little bit quicker. We used to do our uptakes in Hybrid Viewer, so I followed a very similar protocol for drawing all of the regions. So we used the ROI and VOI tool, Visible. Um, so we use the ROI and VOI tool to draw the regions. I used a thresholded region for the two lesions and then I drew all of the organ regions slice by slice. Um, 
When drawing your region slice by slice, you can use the interpolate function. I just drew them slice by slice as I found it a little bit quicker in the end. And then once you've drawn all of your regions for a certain organ, you select all of them, right click, create body from rows. This then gives you a void. At this point, because I'm drawing on the fused image, it's actually drawn on the CT. So you then need to copy it across to the dose map. And you can copy that volume over to the dose map. Here at this point, you can see the only volumes on the dose map are the um, lesions which were thresholded directly onto the dose map. And we end up with our final regions. Um, so you can see here that the liver pretty much, apart from this very top bit of the large lesion, encompasses all of the lesions. This was actually quite important because um, where you can't draw annular regions in hybrid viewer, we had to um, subtract all of the dose from the lesions from the liver and then take a volume weighted average to find the dose to healthy liver. Um, this did mean we couldn't look at the minimum, maximum and standard deviation of dose to the healthy liver, um, but it did at least give us some quantification of dose to healthy liver. And then we get the results. So again, just in the ROI and um, slash VOI tab, you, um, on the dose map, you can find your um, results in units of gray, which is very nice. And these were our final results. Um, we don't have anything to compare them to as yet from um, the SNMMI. Hopefully they'll release some preliminary data soon. They said they have been really overwhelmed by the level of response they've had um, and the range of different methods people have um, formed their dissymmetry by. So one final point, um, when looking at your data, you can look at dose volume histograms. So if you right click on your regions, you can look at the dose volume histogram in graph or table form. And for this is for the spleen in red, lesion one in pink and lesion two in blue. I think this is a really nice visualization of the data um, and obviously a little bit more comparable to our external beam radiotherapy colleagues, even if the graphs are quite as sharp as theirs. <laughs> So um, in summary, Hermes voxel symmetry is really user friendly. It's a similar time commitment for physics staff to our current activity uptake measurements. Um, and I imagine it'll be even quicker once you can load that dose map into, um, into Affinity. We really look forward to taking part in parts two and three of the challenge. I'd like to say a massive thank you to Helena and Steve for their help in um, getting us set up with voxel symmetry and to Dan for his help with the challenge. Any questions? Thanks very much, Laura. That was another really clear demonstration there. I think we need to get you and Will doing user training. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, that was great. Thank you. And absolutely right. Once we can do this um, in Affinity, it will be much nicer. You know, Affinity has really been designed with uh, easy void drawing in mind. Um, yeah. So that will be, be a lot better. Uh, right. I think we're at the point where we can go for a tea break. Is that uh, Katie, we do, have a, we do have a question uh, raised, Helena, in the questions panel. Oh, right. Yes, I see. So this is from um, Joseph Spohr. He asks, um, hi, uh, hi, Will, or let's go, hi, Oxford. Um, thank you for your interesting talks. Uh, do you have any examples of how the clinicians use the data uh, you provide? Um, so I believe my one of my work colleagues, Darren, does a lot more work with working with the consultants to find out what exactly they want and then feeds it back to us. I'm not sure if Dan can comment further on it, but to my understanding, um, the consultants, we have given them a few different things. In past, we used to give them a MIP, a sort of rotating MIP, which had all the volumes on it in hybrid view, mm -hmm. which is quite nice, and they did quite enjoy that. However, unfortunately, okay. with Affinity in the current Affinity 2 state, of course, you don't have a MIP with lovely 3D voice on it, yeah, but I love Affinity 3. It'll be coming <laughs> back again, um, yeah. which will work quite nicely. But yeah, we, we work relatively close with the consultants to figure out what they want exactly so that we can optimize what we're doing so that we're sort of both sides are happy. Um, so would they use that MIP mainly comparatively? So would they see the uptake on, you know, on a second set of therapy and compare it to the first, or are they just checking where the uptake is um, after after one therapy. They use it for both both really. So they do compare it to subsequent therapies. So they, their plan is that the finish will kind of, especially with the stats view and the new, the late the latest version, once it's out, that they'll be able to kind of compare the different cycles, what the mm. absolute uptake was. And that's part of what Lars can do as part of MC is look at that for the patients we've done so far. Um, so then you can kind of really see how those regions are are altering and what actions they take up. So it's not obviously true, but it gives you an indication of what's happening for that particular patient. Mm. 
Interesting. Thank you. All right. Okay. So well, I guess that's. There's no other. I, I can't see any other uh, questions in the panels there, uh, Helena. So, uh, thank you again to the whole Lara and the whole um, Oxford team there, and also to Jill for some uh, great presentations. Really interesting. Thank you. And. Um, we're going to take a break now for 10 minutes. We are a little bit over schedule, but if you can bear with us um, after uh, this tea break, we will uh, return to give you a whirlwind tour of the Hermes dosimetry software that uh, our previous speakers have been uh, talking about. Uh, and we'll still aim to finish on time. 